throughout the month of April, we've been looking at the topic of guilt. And as we close out this series this morning uh, on the topic of guilt, I want to focus on two men who were guilty of hurting Jesus during uh, his darkest hour. On the night that Jesus was arrested and tried and crucified, two men, two of uh, Jesus' disciples, sinned against him in very monumental and, and memorial, uh, memorable ways. Uh, Judas started the evening off by betraying Jesus. He had made a deal with the Jewish leaders to hand Jesus over to be arrested in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. Later on that evening, Peter would deny even knowing who Jesus was. Uh, after Jesus had been arrested, he was kind of following along in the shadows just to see what the fate of his Lord might be. And somebody came up to him and said, hey, aren't you one of Jesus's friends? And he said, no, I, I don't even know who Jesus is. Another person came up to him and said, aren't, are you sure? I mean, you like one of the guys that's been with Jesus. He said, no, it, it's not me. It must be, must be somebody else you've mistaken me for. Then a third time he came up to him and they asked him and said, aren't you one of Jesus's friends, his disciples? And Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was that point or time to the point of even cursing while he denied any relationship with Jesus. So Judas and Peter both turned their backs on Jesus during his darkest hour. Both men were guilty that night. They were guilty. However, when we talk about Peter and Judas today, we tend to remember them a whole lot differently. Uh, Judas, we, we remember him as a betrayer, but we don't even hardly remember the fact that Peter denied Jesus because he did so many other things for, for the kingdom of God. We, we don't remember them necessarily for what they did, but how they responded to their guilt in the aftermath. Judas was motivated by his guilt to completely give up on God. But Peter was motivated by his guilt to get better and do something for the kingdom of God. And I want to look at these two guys and that contrast and those different mentalities of, uh, of dealing with guilt this morning and just see what that means for us. I want to start with looking at Judas in Matthew chapter 27. Verses 1 through 5, the scripture says, Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans for how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him and they led him away and they handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned. For I have betrayed innocent blood. And they replied, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money in the temple and he left. And then he went away and he hung himself. Now, Judas did wrong. And he felt guilty because of the wrong that he had done. He confessed his sin to the Lord. Uh, he confessed it to other people. He even went as far as to try and to undo the wrong that he had done. He went and returned the money, the blood money that he had received. And because they wouldn't take that money, he took it. And instead of keeping it, he threw it into the temple and, and he left. Now, if the story would have stopped right there, Judas would have done everything that God expects for a guilty person to do. He was sorry for what he had done wrong and he wanted to make it right. But the story doesn't end there. When he saw that he couldn't undo what he had done and, and couldn't undo the consequences for his actions, his guilt overcame him. And the story says it ends in verse five by telling us in that passage that he went out and he hung himself. Judas's guilt motivated him. Initially, it motivated him to do the right thing, to repent to have remorse, to be sorry for what he had done. But when he saw that he couldn't do that, he made another choice. He made another decision and he allowed his guilt to motivate him to completely give up. He gave up on Jesus. He gave up on God. He gave up on God's grace. He gave up on the idea of forgiveness and mercy that he had been hearing Jesus preach about for three years at this point. And then ultimately he gave up on his own life. And he killed himself because he gave up. Now then you go and look at what Peter did. Kind of contrast that with Peter who denied Jesus not just once, but denied Jesus three times that night. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection had all taken place, there was some tension between Peter and Jesus. And uh, 
Jesus knew what Peter had done. Peter knew that Jesus had known what Peter had done. And Jesus not being one to kind of ignore the elephant in the room when there was an awkward situation. He brought it to attention. He brought it to Peter's attention so they could have a conversation with this thing and just clear the air once and for all. But I love the way he does this. He does it in a gentle way. He doesn't bring up the fact that he had denied him. Instead, he alludes to it. In John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, the scripture says, When they had Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Then feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then a third time he said to him, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, "Feed, feed my sheep. For truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old... You will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And then Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death to which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. How many times did Peter deny knowing Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask him that question, do you love me? He asked him three times. Jesus didn't have to come right out and address what he was talking about. It was clear. Because Peter knew from the moment that the denial of Jesus had come from his lips, Peter had been eat up with guilt. And he was he was chomping at the bit to find some way to make it up to Jesus, to make this thing right, to to seek his forgiveness, to show him that he was sorry, that he would be willing to confess the name of Jesus before anybody at any time in any situation for the rest of his life. He wanted Jesus to know that. And Jesus let him know that soon enough he would have the opportunity. It would be just a few weeks later on the day of Pentecost that Peter would stand up and he would preach the very first gospel sermon that was ever preached. And from that moment on, Peter would travel the world and he would preach the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He preached the name of Jesus, the very name that he had once denied. The very man that he had once denied, he would go on and and preach that that name would be the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. He would preach until he was arrested for preaching the name of Jesus. Peter would be imprisoned for preaching the name of Jesus. He would be tormented and tortured for preaching the name of Jesus. Eventually, he would be murdered for preaching in the very name of Jesus that he had once denied. Peter was, was crucified. Uh, When he was given the opportunity um, before his death to deny Jesus, he turned that down. And he was willing to go to the cross and die himself for that name that he had one time denied. The only request that he made wasn't to spare his life. The only request that he made was simply, don't crucify me in the exact same manner that you did, Jesus. Turn me upside down because I'm not worthy of dying in the same way and in the same manner of my Lord. Peter's guilt motivated him. But what it did is it motivated him to get better and it motivated him to do better in his life. His guilt motivated him to devote the rest of his life to serving Jesus Christ. I want to point out something that we we often, I don't know if we skip this or maybe we're not aware of it. But we don't talk about this a whole lot from the scripture. About the night that Jesus was betrayed. We always focus on Judah and Peter. But other disciples there too. And those 10 other disciples, they weren't anywhere to be found either. Uh, In fact, they didn't have the chance to deny knowing Jesus because they had already ran. We're told in Mark chapter 14, verse 50, that when on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he was arrested, that when he was arrested, it says, then all of his disciples deserted him and they ran away. It wasn't just Judas and Peter who deserted him. They all deserted Jesus that night. All of them. In fact, I I think it's more appropriate to say it like this. It wasn't just all of them. It was all of us. 
Because in some way or another, every one of us has been in Judas, in the same shoes that Judas and Peter found themselves in that night. We've all sinned. We're all guilty. We've all betrayed or denied Jesus in some way or another, whether it was through our words or through our actions. People were able to look at us and say, you're not living a life that shows that you believe that Jesus is Lord. Just like Judas and just like Peter, we've all felt that guilt and that shame over the things that we've done or the things that we've said. And just like Judas and just like Peter, we all have a choice to make. Our guilt can either motivate us to give up or we can use our guilt to motivate us to get better and to do better. Guilt is the result of a moral failure. At its core, it's because we failed at doing something that God has told us to do or we've not done something that he's told us to. When I look at our culture, that kind of concerns me because our culture is not very good at dealing with failure. We've gotten very soft when it comes to dealing with, with failure. Even the, the most, the, the tiniest of things, it's almost like we don't know how to deal with, with failure in our culture anymore. You don't have to do anything more than go to a little kid's little league baseball game. Little Johnny gets up to the plate and he's so excited to be playing baseball and the bat's bigger than him and, and he's standing up there and the ball comes and, and it goes by him before he, he even thought that he was supposed to swing. And that happens three times in a row and the umpire calls him out. Well, what's, what's the problem? The umpire must be blind if little Johnny struck out. Surely it couldn't be that Johnny hadn't practiced all year long and just showed up. And, you know, surely it couldn't be that. The umpire must be blind. And what do we do? Well, now mom and daddy get to talking about this thing. Grandma and grandpa, they throw in their two cents. And now we're thinking about not playing next year because little Johnny struck out. We can't have this. We can't put up with this kind of failure in life. Heaven forbid we go home and practice in the backyard and try to get better. That's not what we do in our culture. We want to give up at the first sign of failure. Or maybe you go to work and Monday things at work were pretty good, but then on Tuesday it didn't go good. And after that one bad day of work, come home and what is the problem? Well, certainly it wasn't me. It had to be that the boss is an idiot. The boss is an idiot. And, and now as a result of that one day of failure at work, I'm, I'm going to have to look a new job. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. Can't put up with this anymore. Heaven forbid that we look at ourselves and say, maybe I need to step up my game in some way or learn a new skill or be a better employee or take a little bit of responsibility. But the first sign of failure, what do we want to do now? We want to leave and blame somebody else. Or maybe things aren't looking good financially. Maybe you're going through a tough time financially and, you know, what the, the temptation is there, it's... it's it's not my fault because I just went out and spent everything I had on something dumb. No, it, it, it's not that. It must be the politician's fault. It's their fault. They're easy to blame anyway for most stuff. Heaven forbid we go out and bust our butts and, and get a side hustle and try to make things better for our lives financially. No, we just blame Washington for all of our problems. And at the first sign of failure in that, at least we can blame somebody else. But we've, we've got to make different decisions. Or maybe it's your marriage. How many people are giving up on marriage in our culture nowadays? At the first sign of struggle, at the first sign of, of, of any failure, she said something wrong, he said something wrong, he did something wrong, she did something wrong. And, and at the first time that there's a little struggle in marriage, what we hear is it's his fault or it's her fault. And what are we going to do? We're going to go see a lawyer tomorrow. We're going to go see about filing separation papers. Heaven forbid that we realize that this is a covenant that wasn't just entered into by two people, but it was entered into in front of Almighty God. And that we get down on our knees and we pray for those marriages and we seek counsel. People want to give up so easily. We've gotten really bad at dealing with failure in our culture. And sometimes it seeps into the church. And sometimes that mindset, it's adopted by Christians. But listen, failure is a part of life. It is a natural part of life, and, and it's one of the most important parts of life. It is when we fail that most of the time we learn the greatest lessons. We learn the ones that, that stick with us. And if we follow the example of Peter from our text for this morning, it's when we fail that then we can get the motivation to go out and do better. 
and be better so that next time we're faced with the same situation, we might have some success in, in life at that next time. Listen, we are going to mess up. We're going to mess up in, in all the different illustrations I just gave and so many more. We're going to make bad decisions and we're going to fail. And when we do, we're going to naturally but we've got two options. We can allow our guilt to motivate us to just give up and walk away and not have any involvement with anybody or anything, or we can use our guilt to motivate us to get better and to do better. Let me tell you something. God wants you to get better. That's really the whole purpose of guilt in the first place. That's why he convicts you with his Holy Spirit when you sin. He convicts us of our sin because he wants us to have guilt so that we will go out and do better. The reason that the whole reason that he wants us to do that is so that we will do better because he wants us. He has something better for us to do in serving him. That, that's the whole purpose that he convicts us with his Holy Spirit when we sin. And the whole reason we deal with that guilt is so that we can do better and be better for him and for his kingdom. Let's develop that mindset of Peter. Every day we're going to be faced with those two options. Am I going to face my failure and my guilt with the mindset that Judas had? Or am I going to face it with the mindset that Peter had? Father, we thank you that we can come. And we thank you that even in our guilt and shame that you use that, Father, to, to motivate us. And, Lord, we, we see the two options that we've got from that contrast that happened on, uh, Lord, certainly the, the worst night in history as far as justice was concerned when Jesus was uh, betrayed and then denied and later crucified. And we see these things happening, Lord, to him. And we, the fact that one man betrayed him and gave up, and, and the other man denied him and, and didn't. Lord, we see our options in life. Because, Lord, there's been times that every one of us, either through the words that we've said or our actions, have betrayed you, and we've hurt you, and we've been guilty. And, Father, I just pray that we would utilize that guilt that you've given us through your Spirit that we would utilize that as motivation to get better and do better and repent of our sins. And Father, if we're not yet Christians, to, to come to you uh, in faith and, and be baptized into your name, to have all of our sins washed away. Lord, just to be willing to do as Peter did and confess your name before other people and to be willing to do that on a daily basis. Father, we love you. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you've given us, that, that we don't have to be guilty any longer, that you will remove our guilt from us as far as the east is from the west. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.